We left off at Genesis chapter 7 and we finished verse 4. We finished verse 4. And I'm going to continue now at verse 5. Now notice at verse 5 it is repeating from Genesis 6.22. Genesis chapter 7 verse 5. And Noah did according unto all. So Noah did accordingly everything that the Lord commanded him, that the Lord God Almighty told him what to do, commanded him to do. If you recall in our previous Genesis study, this is repeated at Genesis 6.22, and this was repeated at Genesis chapter 7, verse 9. It shows Noah's uh, specific following and obedience to what the Lord wanted him to do. You'll notice that the Bible will talk about at Hebrews chapter 11. We'll turn over there. So we didn't turn to that passage, so I'll show you that quickly. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. Now notice that his faith is counted... At verse 7. Verse 7. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. <clears throat> By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Moved with fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By the which he condemned the world. And became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now you'll notice here that the Bible says. That when he was building the ark. He literally condemned. The world, like he was condemned by the world, he rejected the world, and he was following. Notice the Bible says, uh, he says, oh, righteousness. It says righteousness right here. So, because Noah obeyed the Lord, and he tried to follow as best as he could, according to his conscience, the way that the Lord commanded him to build the ark, that is the reason why the Bible says, it repeats several times, Noah did accordingly everything that God wanted him to do, and he did it. We're also going to go back now. We're going to go back. He obeyed God. That is very important to understand. Noah obeyed God. That is the number one thing that God wants, and I think you've heard from Last Sunday's preaching, the thing that God wants out of everything is just simply obedience. Yeah. Remember, that was the first sin in the garden or the official sin that God didn't want them to commit. That was disobedience. God just wants you to follow what He says. doesn't matter all the pretty pictures or sacrifices that you did for Him. Yeah. He just wants obedience. If you look at verse 6, And Noah was 600 years old. So Noah was obviously 600 years old, that's self-explanatory, when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So when the waters of the flood, or when the flood brought its waters all over the earth, Noah was 600 years old. Now compare that with Genesis chapter 6. Compare that with Genesis chapter 6. Uh, Genesis 5, excuse me, Genesis 5, Genesis 5, not Genesis 6. And then the last part, verse 32, verse 32. So we read here that Noah, he was 600 years old when the flood, when the waters of the flood came upon the earth. Being 600 years old when the flood came, when was it when he started to preach? 500. Now, I'm going to say possibly because some people, uh, creationists, they'll try to say that technically he did not start building the ark at 500. But we're just going to say approximately. It's safe to say approximately. That's the bottom line. So 500 was when he started to build the ark. Approximately 600, that's when the flood came. Understanding these factors, that that was when the flood came, then you'll notice the time gap here of how long it took for him to approximately build the ark, and not only that, warn the world. So we're going to 
see right here, his preaching was basically a hundred years approximately. Look at Genesis 5, 32. And Noah was 500 years old. And Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So he was 500. Then we see at Genesis chapter 7, verse 6, he was 600 when the rain came. So we see here 100 years of preaching. That's what the Bible called him. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. The Bible called him a preacher of righteousness. So when people say that God is such a mean God, they don't realize that God gave them every opportunity in the world. If you have a hundred years of pure preaching, then there is absolutely no excuse. What more can God do? He already given you enough time. What more time could He give? Like a Second Peter chapter 2. Notice verse 5, 2 Peter chapter 2. And we'll read verse 5. And spare not the old world, but save Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So Noah said, Noah is a preacher of righteousness. So he was preaching. Hebrews 11, we read that, that by which he condemned the world. Right. So notice here he was already condemned to the world. The world already knew about Noah. Well, not everyone had the chance. Well, go back to Hebrews 11 again. Let's look at this. Hebrews 11 again. Not everyone had the chance. I mean, you can't say the whole world hurt him. Well, yeah, because Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, read that again. It says, by the which he condemned the world. See, the whole world knew about him. The whole world knew about him. So you got a hundred years of preaching, plus the whole world heard about it. There's no excuse. Go back to Genesis 7 now. Genesis 7. Now you're going to see so many times that they had every chance in the world. Look at Genesis chapter 7, and we'll read verse 7. Now remember, I'm going to read every single word and interpret it and explain every single word in the verse. That way you can understand every word that you're reading and studying. Genesis chapter 7 verse 7. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark. So notice that Noah went inside the ark. His sons went inside the ark. His wife went inside the ark. His sons' wives with him went with Noah inside the ark. If you recall Hebrews, uh, if you recall 2 Peter chapter 2, it says eighth person, right? So then we know that there were eight people inside the ark. Now before you think about quitting the ministry or you feel like that, well, I haven't got led a lot of souls to salvation and that I got less than 10 people in my church. Look at Noah. Yeah. He only had eight people. Eight people. Compared to the whole world. But guess what? The whole world was wrong and Noah was right. right yeah. And Noah was preaching 100 years. We get missionaries and preachers falling out after 10 years and they think they did enough. Wow. Let that bring some conviction to you. Yeah. Let that bring that some conviction to you. Uh, my favorite, uh, the people that I looked up to as my role models were definitely not D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, because uh, uh, I would have been totally discouraged and quit the ministry. The ones who were my role models were Noah, Jeremiah, preachers that were small time but pastored for years, Pastor Hilton Smith, Pastor Steve Andrus, Pastor Joshua Stevenson, Pastor Randy Gorski. I think I'm in very good company with the California pastors Amen. here. If I'm much bigger than those guys, then maybe I'd start questioning my own skills or my preaching, how the way I handle the ministry, right? So the point is, what's the point? The point is, the Lord can use large ministries, don't get me wrong, but what I'm trying to drive at here is that people who are my models are small-time preachers because I do everything right by the book, and then no matter how right I try to do the ministry, my ministry just don't grow. The people, they leave. I feel like I've done something wrong. That's the mind of every preacher. Or they feel like that it's too hard of a feel, might as well quit. But you got to realize this, that you're not the only one. We have that solo mentality that we have to break. 
And we have to keep looking at other people the Lord God has used. All right, let's go back to our main text here. Uh, verse, the last part of verse 7, because of the waters of the flood. So in other words, because the flood is coming in, that's the reason why Noah and his family went inside the ark. So this is an indicator. So there are two things that you want to notice. If you recall back at uh, verse 4, right? If you recall at verse 4, and if you look later on at verse 10, the pointer here, which is kind of a little bit of a confusion, and I'm not too sure how much is true or false. I don't know exactly when Noah went inside the ark. That's the thing. I really don't know. I really don't know when is it that he went inside the ark. You'll notice if, we, if you look at those two verses that I mentioned, uh, just let me know if I'm out of bounds. I trust that I'm not. So seven days... That God said, for yet seven days, and then after that, I'm going to rain 40 days. So there are two time periods here, which is for some strange reason. I have no idea why the Lord did that. But the question is, when did he go inside the ark? Some people say that he went inside the ark and then was waiting inside for seven days, patiently waiting on the Lord. And then other people say that after the seven days, as soon as it started to flood and rain, that's when they went inside the ark. So I'm not sure which is true or false. But to give uh, the argument for this one right here, when the waters of the flood started to come, the 40 day would probably be verse 7 here. Why did they go inside? Because of the waters of the flood, right? Yeah, right? So that's possibly the reason why he went inside the ark once it started to rain. Once it started to rain. If you'll notice verse 10, the reading too, and it came to pass after seven days, see that after the seven days, the waters of the flood were upon the earth, right? Right? That matches with the wording of the last part of verse 7, because of the waters of the flood. So maybe, maybe that's the reason why. Maybe that's the, the 40 day would be the, uh, the argument right there. But again, I'm not too sure. All right, we'll read verse 8. We'll read verse 8. So his family went inside the ark. Now notice what's in the category with him. The animals at verse 8 and 9. So there's no doubt that when we're talking about what is kind, that's what the evolutionists will say, it's within the context of survival of many different races. That's what God had in mind. So it's enough where the animals and humankind survive. And obviously, uh, humankind with just eight people, you know, uh, what did the Lord do? He didn't put every single species of humankind in there. So he just put enough to survive and through, uh, through uh, length of time, and evolutionists believe in evolution, so I don't know why they don't, they don't believe that uh, with Noah's Ark and the animals, where you give a long period of time and then they adapt, and then you can get many different species as a result. So I don't understand about that. We believe that with the humans right here, with Noah and his family. For evolutionists who criticize about kind, they sh debunk their own teaching about evolution where we're trying to support them right here. <laughs> we're trying to support you right here that, yeah, they adapt. They can change. In micro stages, obviously, not macro stages. Yeah. yeah. Right, All right, let's go to verse 8. Verse 8. Of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. Okay, so obviously remember there were clean animals and animals that were not clean. The birds were put in there. So notice that the aquarium was not in there. And of everything that creepeth upon the earth. Any animal that can creep or crawl. So they went inside the ark. Verse 9, there went in two and two unto Noah. So notice what went in was two by two. They went to Noah inside the ark, the male and the female. So the reason why it's two, it's because one is male, the other one is female. Now notice that the, verse 9 will prove 
And not only verse 9, but verse 15 will prove that the interpretation of chapter 7, verse 2, when it says by sevens, that God was seeing only two. All right, what does, in other words, he was only seeing pairs, okay? So it's not seven, it's two. But remember for the clean beast, it's uh, at verse two, sevens of pairs, right? Seven by two. But all God saw was male and female, male and female, male and female. It wasn't an odd number. It was all even. Okay, so these verses will prove that because all God saw was two and two and two and two going in. Male and female, male and female. You might say, why didn't God put seven and just put male and female? I could probably take a guess. It's because God does not believe in LGBTQ+. I think God just wants to make it clear. Male, female, male, female, that's it. You know, maybe that's the reason why. So that's my wild guess. Good guess. <laughs> verse 9, the latter part of verse 9, as God had commanded Noah. Again, it repeats, Noah followed God's command. As God commanded Noah, the animals went in. Now that's important at verse 9. What you'll notice right here at verse 9, it's accordingly to God's command. God's command. So because God commanded it, that's why those animals went in two by two. So then some people will go, or some of the skeptics will go, how can Noah catch all the animals? Well, simple, stupid, because God commanded it. All right? If God didn't command it, then how can we disprove atheism, you poor atheist, you? So we have to have a God to put in a miracle. Uh, that way we can disprove atheism. Maybe because the atheists don't want their belief to be disproven, and that's the reason why they must find a scientific explanation for Noah's Ark. If we keep putting some kind of uh, scientific explanation to everything in Noah's Ark, if we keep doing that, then we disprove God. Then we disprove the miracles, the supernatural workings of God. Now, uh, understanding that the animals went because of God's power. The animals were the one that went to Noah. Noah wasn't the one catching all the animals. Uh, we're going to look, one proof text is right here, which we saw, as God had commanded Noah at verse 9, right? Another reason why is because of chapter 6, verse 20. Look at chapter 6, verse 20. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort, see all the pairs, shall come unto thee. See, they're going to come to you, Noah. So that's important to understand. You'll also notice chapter 7, verse 9. Let's read that again. Chapter 7, verse 9. Notice the wording here. There went in two and two unto Noah. Mm -hmm. See that? Why? As God had commanded. Yeah. See, the pairs are going to Noah. Noah doesn't have to go to them. So we notice right here that the Lord has shown from his proof text that the animals were the one that came to Noah. Now think about this, okay? There is no doubt that uh, when the stupid movie Noah came out, that they pictured God as, some, as a mean type of God, but they overlooked this one. One, he gave a hundred years of preaching. hundred years. Two, they got the greatest evidence, and the greatest evidence is that the animals were walking by pairs in a neat manner for some weird reason inside Noah's Ark and literally all these animals were walking. They were just walking in, in an orderly marching fashion and went inside the Ark and the whole world saw that. There is no doubt that, uh, I mean, you got the greatest evidence of God's power and Noah said, look, a flood's coming and the Lord's going to drown out everything. So to preserve humankind and the animal race, why don't you come with us? Oh, that's ridiculous. But then if you see those animals marching inside, wouldn't you probably think twice and say, I think I need to get saved. I think I need to go inside Noah's Ark. But you know what? No, it still won't work inside this wicked world. Why? No matter what, how great the evidence, the greatest evidence to Christianity right now that you cannot debunk is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's still a very hot debate uh, within philosophical uh, circles and even scientific circles. That is very hardcore evidence. But guess what? Mankind still rejects that no matter how great the evidence is. Uh, one of the 
My favorite Christian apologist that people like is William Craig. And then when he was debating this uh, hardcore atheist, he was talking about, uh, well, you know, unless that stone was rolled away and unless I saw Jesus' body come out, then I would believe. And William Craig said, wouldn't you believe that it's a hallucination? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he kept arguing for hallucination, hallucination. And then uh, Craig said, well, you probably think you were hallucinating, right? That's right. What's his pointer here? The pointer is no matter even if you saw it, you're going to try to rationalize it. Yeah. You're going to give every scientific explanation in the world. You might say, why is that? Because you are built to do that, you dumb, wicked, stupid humans, you. Amen. You might say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Because you always give your reason to justify the way you do things. Yeah. Wow. And by the way, what's even worse than a scientific reason and a rational reason is you're giving a spiritual reason. That's the worst that you can do. Yeah. All right? Never justify yourself that way. I think you've heard from last Sunday's preaching about that, right? Mm -hmm. You all learned about that. There's a heavy price to that that the devil could use yeah. if you're not yeah. careful. Yeah. So not much better than the atheist, I guess. Probably even worse we are by using spiritual excuses. Right. So sometimes you have to think and pray about that for a while. Anyways, if we go back to the text here, point is, is that they have saw God's power. So God gave them every chance in the world, but they rejected it. So what more can God do? I mean, a hundred years, that's quite a long time. What more can he do? He gave them every chance in the world. So when that flood came down, guess what? There's no turning back, no second chance. That means it's it. They keep trying to find God's mercy in his judgment. You notice that? No, judgment would not be judgment if there's mercy in there. Right. So then, in other words, no one let us in. And then the movie made God such a cruel God. And they said, well, well he should have been merciful and let them in. Then you erase God's judgment. Right, right. When God says judgment, that means judgment. That means judgment. So when God uh, pounds the gavel, and if every court system let every person slide, yeah. then you know what? That's not called justice. That's called yeah. mercy. Yeah. It's judgment and justice, and there is no judgment and justice if you put mercy in there. Right. Well, I thought God's a merciful God. Yeah, you put it at the wrong timing there. Right. Yeah. You, have to, you forgot 100 years. That's, I don't see judgment. I don't see judgment here. When people mock at Noah, God didn't even put a finger on them. He let them mock his servant. That's a lot of mercy right there. 100 years condemned by the world. And then animals walking by pairs. People mocking, trying to give rational, scientific explanations. Not giving credit to God's power, but to some kind of whim. You don't think, man, what a disgrace to God. But God was merciful. He let them mock. See, they don't pay attention. So when people give this argument about Noah's flood, how God is unmerciful, you give them the argument that God was way merciful to them. Yeah. Way merciful. Well, he wasn't merciful when he drowned out the people. Well, hey, silly, that's called judgment, not mercy. You think this is mercy. Does this look like mercy to you? Does this look like the song, mercy said no? Is that what it looked like right there? No, it doesn't. It, it has, I mean, this is the wrath of God. Yeah. You put mercy in there, you get rid of wrath. Then you get rid of the meaning of wrath and judgment. We might as well get rid of that definition then. Okay, let's go to Genesis 7 again. Genesis chapter 7. Again, I'm explaining each and every word. That's the point of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. So that uh, some of you who don't understand uh, your Bible reading, this can be very helpful to you. And you get a common sense gist. And I... I told you before, and I'll say it again, I had people here who came, and they said, Pastor, I can't understand the Bible. And I said, just keep coming to verse-by-verse -verse Bible studies. You'll eventually get it. Keep reading your Bible. You'll eventually get it. Guess what? Within uh, two years, they got it down. Now it became easy to them. All right? All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 7, and we'll read verse 10 now. Verse 10. And it came to pass after seven days, so after the seven days time was up, that what happened? That the waters of the flood were upon the earth. God sent the waters of the flood. Now, you'll notice right here, uh, God split it, right? At verse 4, seven days, and then 40, right? 
So I always wonder, why would God put seven right here? But you know, uh, that's the third evidence of God's mercy. See, after God put the animals inside the ark, and right when, okay, Lord, send your judgment, God says, let's wait one more time. I'm going to give them one more chance. So whatever his reason for putting seven days in there, one thing I could see right here is that this is definitely another chance for them that he gave. He gave them seven more days. So, uh, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Get saved. All right? The Lord's giving them every chance in the world. Even at D-Day, right when D-Day hit, D-Day hit, God's like, let's give them seven more days. You know, it may be possible that God is such a merciful God that with this timetable, when he's supposed to send his judgment, that he could probably prolong it a bit more. Uh, this just, uh, I didn't study for this, so this just dawned on me. So let's look at some scriptures right here, all right? Let's look at Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. So I'll go from the top of my head right here. Let's look at Hebrews 9. And we're going to see some examples. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Now I want you to go to Matthew 24. Now I want you to go to Matthew chapter 24. Notice when God puts an appointed time that God could do something out of mercy. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 9. And then we'll read verse 27. Verse 27. The Bible says, And as it is appointed, see that? So God appoints something. Unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So God appoints a set time where he, everyone has to die and be judged. Right? So we can all agree with that. But uh, that even though God makes a general rule on that one, God can make the exception. We see that Enoch was the exception to that one. You might be the exception to that one. Yeah. All right? Yeah. All right? Yeah. Y'all kind of slow on that one. All right? You don't know what a pre-tribulation rapture is? All right. All right. Uh, there's a passage at Proverbs that God, he might just get more upset even. And cut you off before your appointed time. Yeah. But look at Matthew 24. Here's an example of mercy now. So we see mercy with Enoch, probably in our case. But look at Matthew chapter 24. And then we'll look at verse 22. Verse 22. Notice what God can do with the, the appointed time and clock, with judgment. Verse 22. And except those days should be shortened. See? God's shortening the days. Why? Why? He's doing it for the sake of there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sakes, those days shall be shortened. See, for the elect's sake right here, God's going to show mercy and shorten the days. Uh, go back to Genesis 7. Go back to Genesis 7. So we see right here an example of God's mercy. Yes. God's mercy. So, be, so the point is when God has his D-Day set up, this is my appointed time of judgment. Hebrews 9.27. I'm going to judge you. God could give His last minute mercy right there. Praise the Lord. How about that? How about that? You can't do that even in today's court. You can't do that. Here's the court. Here's the set day. And once we put you guilty, we put you guilty. Set day. But you know what? God says, no, uh, I can give mercy. Last minute. Pretty merciful God. Amen. Pretty merciful God. I don't know what's the matter with this distorted mind of the world. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 7. Now we're going to read verse 11. Verse 11. I think my watch battery died. What time is it now? 11. Okay, all right, so it's, it's still working then. Okay, sorry about that. All right then. Uh, let's look at verse 11. Verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, so when Noah re reached 600 years in his life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, so this is at the second month, at the 17th day of that month. Uh, I'll explain that part later when we hit Genesis 8, all right? But the point is, it's at, it happened at the 17th day of the second month, whatever that is, whenever that is. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. So it's right there at that 17th day of the month, at that very same day, whatever this wording is, it calls it fountains of the great deep. 
So fountains were bursting out from the great deep. Now this could be pretty obvious when you're when you know your Bible in Genesis, context of Genesis, in our previous verse-by-verse -verse Genesis study, you know what the deep is. The deep is referring to up there. It's referring to up there. Uh, creationists, they make that mistake. They say that it's just the water uh, below the earth. But the problem with that teaching, which atheists and evolutionists argue against, is that you got boiling water down there. So when you have boiling water down there and that makes up the majority of your water, and that's pretty much a problem. So the Bible believers, if you're a Bible believer and not just an independent fundamental Baptist or just a creationist, then you know better. You know what that's referring to? That's referring to the deep way up there. And even scientists admit, admit that, that there's a huge body of water right at the end of outer space over there. They'll even admit that themselves. So that would make sense, way more sense on, and has way more logic where the water would come from. But you also have to realize that it says the fountains of the great deep, what? Broken up, broken up. If you go all the way out there, it's frozen, obviously. It gets more and more cold. And then uh, if you go through the earth's atmosphere and then land upon the earth, it's solid object, but then it can, what, break apart. So, see, this would make way, way more sense. This matches even scientifically speaking. Creationists are trying to be so scientific that they become unbiblical and even unscientific. But when you stick to Scripture, then science matches up amazingly. All right, so just be a Bible believer. That's it, all right? Oh, that's a crazy teaching that there's a huge body of water out there in the great deep because some old geezer taught that at the 60s right there, and he's just a Lulu right there. <laughs> Not anymore, buddy. Man, when you hit the 2000s, then scientists start to catch up. And why? Because some old geezer just stick to the Word of God. I don't look at an old geezer. I just look at the Word of God. God can, use a, God can use a green colored six year old for all I care to teach that. And if it's in the Word of God, I believe it. All right? People just look at personalities and people too much. They don't look at the Word of God. They don't look at the Word of God. Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 7. All right, so the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. So then the windows of heaven opened up and gave the water. So the creationists, see, they tie, verse 11, with fountains, meaning below, the deep broke apart and water came out. And then they say the water up in the atmosphere, the windows of heaven opened up. But actually, in the Bible, this is all the same thing. When it talks about the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows where heaven were open, it's referring to the same thing. It's the water up there. Why? Windows of heaven literally meaning heaven up there, where heaven is. Heaven opened up its window, and only God can give that much water. Now, you might say, how so? Look at the book of Malachi. We're going to look at the book of Malachi. Now, let me say this as a disclaimer. I do believe that water can come from the atmosphere and water did come from below the ground. And, I might, and I'm going to show you some verses on that one too, which will be interesting, okay? So yes, I can admit that, that some of that uh, came to pass. However, you can't say all, uh, when you look at the scriptures here, there's no doubt you can't deny the water from up there where God abides, his abode. There's no doubt about that when you look at the scriptures. Okay, let's look at Malachi. And then we're going to look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. Now notice what God words it out right here. We're going to look at Malachi. Then we're going to look at chapter 3. Notice at verse 10. Verse 10. Bringing all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven. Now, isn't that what God said? He's going to open up the windows of heaven. But you can guess where this comes from. And pour you out a what? Blessing. Where do blessings come from? Above, Above God. Yes. 
It don't just come from the sky. You know, sky don't give you, uh, skies don't give you God's blessing. It's God up there that gives you the blessing. God gives a blessing to them, but he does it through what? The windows of heaven. Through the windows of heaven. Okay, uh, let's go back. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis. Now, there's another passage at Kings, but we won't turn there. But basically, one, uh, if windows of heaven is referring to the atmosphere right here, then one of the soldiers should be pretty ignorant. Because he said, you know, uh, he... Uh, said, you know, does God really have windows in heaven? What did he mean by that? He didn't mean the atmosphere, because that's common sense. Water can come from above, that there are openings up there. He was referring to God up in heaven where it had windows. See? He took that as, does God really have a window in heaven? And Elisha says, yeah, I'm going to prove it. You're going to die. <laughs> guess what? He did die. So I guess we should take seriously, God does have windows up there. Maybe we should take it that way, right? So, we do know that doctrine then is true, that the, uh, there is a window up there in heaven. If we look at Hebrews, uh, not Hebrews, Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. That's all within the same context. Now, I'm going to show you something interesting where we can include the waters from below too. So, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1, context, right? Where it mentions about the deep. Let's look at Genesis 1. And then I want you to go to Job 38. We're going to look at Genesis 1. And then I want you to turn to Job 38. Now let's see what God, when he first mentions the deep here, then we can see what happened to this body of water. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Verse 2. The Bible says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Alright, so what happened to this deep. Verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters. So that's the deep. But where did the deep go? Which were under the firmament. So there is waters below here. From the waters which were above the firmament. It also went above. Now, what is the waters below? Uh, real quickly, I've said this too many times, so I'm just going to make this quick. Verse 10, the waters below is where your seas are. Uh, the waters above, what's that referring to? Well, the firmament at verse 14 is referring to the universe, outer space. So there are waters above outer space. Where is that found at? If you look at Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, guess what? Sea of glass. And God called the waters below what? Sea at Genesis 1.10. No coincidence why he called it sea up there as well. And when you compare that with G Revelation 21, he said the sea, singular, yeah. is no more. Why? What's the sea referring to? Context is Revelation 4 and Revelation 14, 15 or 14. It's referring to that sea of glass. So there is no doubt. Uh, when we total it all together, that God, He was just sending water basically everywhere. He just let the waters come from below, but we can't see majority of water come from there. Scientifically, that wouldn't make sense, but it would, it would make way more sense when the fountains of the Great Deep broken up, the frozen part, combining with the heat from the bottom. No wonder you get full cataclysmic event. That would make sense. That's how you get the Grand Canyon, the volcano eruptions, everything. And then uh, you find fossils of animals giving birth. And yeah. while they're giving birth, at the same time, they're fossilized. What happened? They were covered with something. Uh, you see animals and trees covering different layers, different layers of ground. So if each layer of ground is supposed to represent a couple uh, thousands of years or millions of years, man, they just pass by three time periods. Yeah. That's pretty crazy unless there's a flood. That messed everything in all the layers of the ground. You get seashells on top of mountains. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying all this as evidence that there is Noah's flood. Now this should be great evidence that there is a flood, Noah's flood, and that evolution is a bunch of bunk. And uh, the best book that I would recommend is, there are several books, but you can get the book called Flood by Rewinkle. By Rewinkle, it's called Flood. And then it'll give you all the scientific uh, evidence is over there of the flood. It is immensely amazing. All right, you're at Job 38, right? Look at the passage here. 
We're going to look at what the Bible says about the deep, that it's frozen. That's what he says. Job 38, verse 30. Job 38, verse 30. Verse 30. The waters are hid as with a stone. See that? And the face of the deep is frozen. See? There is a deep that's frozen. All right, let's go back now to Genesis 7. Genesis chapter 7. So there is no doubt that this is referring to the water coming from above. That would make way, way more sense. My, my, all you saw was the wrath of God that time. You, got, you talk about a scary thing. If we look at verse 12, And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So th there was rain pouring down all over the earth and went forty days and forty nights. Basically, if you're going to have waters that would cover the top of uh, Mount Everest, and you're supposed to get an immense amount of water, including the rainfall, then what would that total down to? Well, Dr. Ruckman, he mentioned in his commentary, if it's true, that it would cover over 700 feet per day. So it would cover 700 feet per day if you want to reach the top of Mount Everest. So that's a huge amount of water right there. If you have over 700 feet per day, not even the giants could survive that one. You'll notice that. Not even the giants could survive that. So God made sure that all of the wickedness within his creation, that the sons of God intermingled, the mutants and then uh, the sons of God, their offspring, Nephilim, everything, every word that you want to call it, all those descriptions that mythologies, Native Americans, Chinese stories, Hindus have talked about, all of that, they don't just come from thin air. They all share the same story in different versions. So that means they retrieved it from their ancestors. The ancestors had an original source and story. That's basic mythology 101. You can't get a mythology unless you get it from a genuine source. So that's how you get a myth born. A myth where it gets a stretched, exaggerated version is they get it from a legitimate source somewhere. So there has to be a first legitimate source somewhere. And then it's carried to exaggeration after that. So they all got, so there is no doubt that Genesis 6 is true. Noah's flood is true. There are too many uh, mythology, stories, legends that all combine with the same, uh, same story but just in, amount to different versions. So they got it from their ancestors somewhere. Let's go now to Genesis chapter 7. And then verse, 13, uh, verse 12, it says 40. And you, the significance of 40, as I mentioned in previous Genesis study, is representing trial, testing. Verse 13, In the self same day enter Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth. So notice, in the same day, that's what it's talking about, self same. In that exact same day, Noah entered Shem, Ham, Japheth, who are the sons of Noah, they entered inside the ark. Now notice that verse 13, the very exact same day, does not match with verse 12, 40 days, 40 nights, right? So it's the exact same day, but then verse 12, if we're going by context, it's 40 days. So that doesn't make sense. There are two possibilities. Uh, possibility one is that it could be a metaphorical expression, just like Genesis 2 that I pointed out to you, right? When I pointed out Genesis uh, chapter 2 and verse 4, when I talked about the generations of the heaven and the earth in the day when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, singular. So it could be that metaphorical expression, one. Or number two, it could be more literal and more easy than you think. Basically, verse 13 through 16 is repeating... It's repeating verse 7 through 10. Verse 7 through 10. Which it is, if you read it. Yeah. And then basically it's talking about the one day, the self-same day, that because it does take one day for Noah and his family to go inside the ark. So it's at that day when Noah and the family went inside the ark. So it could be verse 13 through 16, it could be just repeating verses 7 through 10, which is more likely, which is more likely than a metaphorical interpretation. Because of context... Uh, of chapter 7 itself and taking the verse literally as it says. All right, now we got a problem here, okay? So uh, let me just read everything first 
and then I'll tell you the problem. The problem is this seems to support, I think, what it's called the groff wellhausen theory. And you might go, what is that? Yeah, exactly. What is that? Basically, it shouldn't even exist. All right, It's not important. But for some weird reason, PhD scholars think it's very important. And they want you to know that basically there were multiple writers for the book of Genesis. Why? Because one writer wrote 7 through 11, and then... Guess what? 13 through 16 is repeating, so there must be a second writer. Well, hey, stupid, maybe it's the same writer who repeated. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, duh, you know, what in the world? So, I don't understand how this proves their point that there were multiple writers in Genesis. I mean, how do you not know it's the same writer, especially when they're like back to back against each other, yeah. you know? So, uh, that's supposed to be the Graf Wellhausen theory, and it definitely is a theory. It's not even a theory. It's more like a fairy tale, to be honest. So they just like to put theory because it just sounds scientific, okay? It just sounds scientific, right? When they, when they say theory, just say myth. Just say fairy tale. I mean, they call Jesus' resurrection a fairy tale of myth. I mean, why don't you call it that, too? That's good. Let's go back to uh, verse 13 here. So let's uh, repeat the passage and talk about the problem, and then I'll explain it. The latter part of verse 13, and the three wives of his sons with them. So the three wives of Noah's sons, uh, w following along Noah's sons with them into the ark. They went inside the ark. They, so those are the people, and every beast after his kind. Now, notice right here, verse 14 can tell you what kind is. They, referring to the human kind, and every beast after his kind. See? Following along the context of the humans there. Mm -hmm. So you can see right here, verse. Uh, there is no doubt in God's mind, the kind of animals that he was thinking was following along the humans that went inside the ark. So there is no doubt about that. They, uh, let's keep reading verse 14. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind. So cattle also went inside, not just the beast. And every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. So all uh, creatures that can creep. And every fowl after his kind. The birds after their kind went inside. Every bird, every bird of every sort. So every bird of every sort went inside. So notice that kind is explained as sort. And when you look at the scriptures about the word sort, you'll notice that it's not referring to every minute detail of species. It's just referring to generally the difference, a general difference, how you perceive and look at it. Verse 15, And they went in unto Noah into the ark. So all those animals went to Noah. So again, verse 15 showed you the animals came to Noah. Went to Noah inside the ark. Two and two of all flesh. So see, there's no doubt it's only pairs, all right? God sees only two people for the sex, and that's male and female. God wanted it strictly that way, of all flesh. I like how the Bible says that. So in other words, if you see a third gender there or a fourth sex, then that shouldn't be considered flesh right there. You're not a normal flesh. All right, let's, uh, I have to say that. All right, let's keep reading. The last part of verse 15, wherein is the breath of life? So God says, all flesh has life in them that has breath. And they that went in, so all the animals are human, went in male and female of all flesh. Why did God repeat that again? I think God wants to, I, I'm, I think I'm starting to believe my theory now. I think God just wants to make it clear that it's only two. There's no three, four LGBTQ plus. All right, there's only two. Let me make that clear. Two and two, he says at verse 15. Amen, yeah. yeah, amen, right there, all right? He's, <laughs> and he says, anything that has life should be two and two. Yeah. That's why he keeps repeating. And he says, male and female of all flesh. Isn't that what he said at verse 16? Yeah. So see, it's only male and female. All right, there's no she-male in there, all right? Yeah. <laughs> now let's keep reading here. As God had commanded him. So that's according to God's command. So notice that God commanded, Noah followed. Again and again, Noah was obedient. He followed to the letter. And I've given you verses to explain that already. So I'm not going to do that again. And the Lord shut him in. All right, now let me explain the problem with verse 13 through 16. Why did the writer repeat again? Look at Mark 9. Mark 9. We'll look at Mark 9 and 2 Peter 3. We're going to look at Mark 9 
And then we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Now notice that God repeated, for some weird reason, three times here at Genesis chapter 7. You notice that? All right. Mark 9. We'll skip 2 Peter 3. We'll skip that one and go to Revelation 4 instead. We're going to go to Revelation 4 instead. All right? The three repetitions in Genesis 7 that you want to pay attention to are Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. All right, Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 through 6. Excuse me, Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 through 6. Second time repeated, Genesis chapter 7 through verse 10. Genesis chapter 7, verse 7 through 10. Third time repeated, uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 13 through 16. Genesis chapter 7, verse 13 through 16. Why is it repeated three times? There are two theories for this. The first theory is the most logical. The most logical is that if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 7, why, uh, uh, what we do know is this. When God repeats something, that means it's important. Yes? Okay, that's a no-brainer. I can dare say all Bible scholars can agree with that one. Except those who chop off repetition verses. Okay, but uh, I, I digress. But the point is, is that when God uh, repeats something, we know that we have to pay special close attention. There's a reason why. When I see his repetition here, what do I see as the idea? The idea is preserving life here. Life is precious to God. You'll see verse 15, God says, wherein is the breath of life. So he takes that very importantly. If you look at the three repetitions, it's all about a preservation of life here. How God takes life very seriously. You know what I think? I think God takes a soul very seriously. Amen. I think God takes a soul very seriously. Amen. You might say, why is that? Because he did that with hell. Mark chapter 9. Mark 9. He takes a soul seriously. You know what I'm going to drive at? Three times he repeats it. Yeah. Mark 9, 44. Mark 9, 46. Mark 9, 48. Excuse me. If you have a modern Bible translation, you don't oh. see that repetition. Oh. Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. You want me to give you another one? For the Son of Man come to seek and to say that which is lost. A soul repeated. But guess what? Modern Bible translations oh, cut that off. Wow. You know what I think? I think Satan doesn't care about souls yeah. and would like people to be damned and burned in hell for all eternity. That's right. How about that? So that's the reason why God takes a soul very, very seriously Amen. right here. Now look at Revelation chapter 4. How I tie it as 3 is because uh, uh, breath of life, right? Mankind and creation has life, but in order to have life, body, soul, and spirit. Genesis chapter 2, he breathed into his nostril the breath of life, man became a living soul. But that same verse covered body, soul, and spirit. Why? Body, soul, and spirit is to represent God in the image of God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It connects to the Trinity. Why? Because God repeats it for the Trinity. Holy, holy, holy to worship. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. All right, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So it's supposed to cover the Trinity. So you know what? I think it, I see it as a disgrace to chop out a verse in the Bible yeah. because maybe you're chopping off an important attribute of God with His Trinity, one. And number two, the bottom line is, even if that's theoretical, the bottom line is you chopped off something that is considered important to God. Yeah. Yeah. If you repeat, do you ever repeat in an instruction to somebody, yeah. especially little children who don't get it? You know why? They don't get it. Yeah. And not only that, it's very important to you that they know it. Yes. So that's the bottom line. Even if you say everything that I say is theoretical, the bottom line is it don't change the fact God saw it as something very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, I would like to ask the modern Bible translations if they think it was unnecessary for Mark 9 about uh, the worm dieth not fire is yeah. not quenched, about a soul, oh. or the soul that the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Why don't they do that with Genesis 7 then? Yeah. 
Huh. I mean, repeat it three times. Why don't you, don't, you don't see verses chopped off over there. Strange people, strange bunch, aren't they? They aren't scholars after all. You know what they are? They're just full of pride and they just want to correct the Bible where they deem fit. You and I have absolutely no right to correct that book. Yeah. That book corrects us. Yeah. That book corrects us. Amen. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. All right, the last part of verse 16. The last part of verse 16. So I explained the Groff Wilhausen lie, all right, not a theory, all right. <laughs> Notice right here, the last part of verse 16, and the Lord shut him in. That's special. So once the animals and everybody went inside the ark, do you remember the spiritual application here that I explained to you? The spiritual application that I explained to you earlier here was that this is referring, if you might remember, to your salvation, yes? Uh, there's no doubt we can see that. Why? Because Noah's salvation depended on the ark. We saw that. All right. Uh, we read that earlier. I'm not going to do that again. So Noah's salvation was the ark. That's how he got saved. If he, uh, if he was lost, then he should have drowned out with the whole lost world. So then his salvation was building a boat and getting inside the ark. So there is no doubt that the ark is representing our salvation. So that's the spiritual picture right there, the spiritual application. If that's our salvation, remember what I explained to you? Going in is representing like John chapter 10, right? Getting in Jesus Christ for salvation, yes? Amen. All right. Now, the la I didn't mention this part, the shutting now. Now God did the shutting. You know what that is? Yeah. Ephesians 1. Amen. Ephesians 1. Yep. You know what? God did once you got in, you can't get out. You can't get out of your salvation. He shut you in. He shut you in. He don't lie. Let's go look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So it is biblical when people say OSAS is a lie that you tell them to shut up. It is biblical. You might say, why? Because the Lord shut him in, all right? All right? So it is biblical to say shut up then. All right. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. All right. That's not doctrine, all right? Don't take offense, all right? Don't get sensitive, all right? That's not doctrine, all right? That shut up is biblical, that one. That's not doctrine, all right? All right. Ephesians chapter 1 verse... Ephesians chapter 1. Now, some of you want to take it as doctrine. Be my guest, you know? Just say shut up then to the people who make you doubt your salvation, who make oh, yeah. you question your salvation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, make, who claim that you have to do more good works, who are judgmental and say you're not saved like I am, who do John MacArthur, Paul Washer, Ray Comfort, Lordship Salvation garbage, that should be shut up. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, those people should shut their mouths. Amen. They are wicked people making people doubt their salvation. Yeah. Taking away a precious promise from the scripture that God has given to you. Amen. Never recommend these guys. Never show their videos to other people. Never recommend their materials. I mean, these guys are to be cut off. Amen. These guys are heretics. Yeah. Like Ephesians chapter 1. We'll look at verse 13. In whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. All right. Are you saved? Are you in the boat? Yes, sir. All right. Are you in Jesus Christ? All right. In whom also after that he believed. So you're in it, right? You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. See, you're locked. You're sealed. You're shut up. All right, look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Now show this to a lordship salvationer. Look at Ephesians 4, 30. <clears throat> no matter how much you sin against God, even if people deem you, well, you're not a saved Christian because a saved Christian wouldn't commit these sins. And no, no matter how much you grieve the Holy Spirit, you're sealed. You're shut up. Look, Noah could have gotten drunk in the ark. He didn't have to do it after Noah's ark. He could have gotten drunk in the ark, but he's still stuck inside the boat. Why? He got shut in. Once you're shut in, you're done, man. All right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. See, you can grieve God all you want, but guess what? You got sealed. You got locked up. All right. So uh, we'll close it right here. Uh, I'll explain Genesis 7, 17 through 24 about the flood. And 
I was going to get to a very, very interesting theory. Remember about the, uh, the disappearance of the Garden of Eden that I talked about? Those possible sons of God, and I mean a different kind from Adam and Eve's children. And then about how did the uh, sons of God survive? Next Genesis study. We'll see you Sunday. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, thank you so much for the truth of thy word. It is a precious book. It is a holy book. Uh, we can glean so many important things. And uh, as the verse says, open thou mine eyes, and I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Dismiss uh, us now with your blessing. Bless the break. Bless the next preacher, the presentation. Give us a fresh burden for lost souls. Help us to give like we never given before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.